problems, suffering, issues, challenges. What is the purpose of these problems? We've heard the saying that bad things happen to good people. Do issues and problems only happen to good people? Why do they happen? What is the purpose of these issues that we have? Why is it that some people seem to do everything wrong under the sun and they don't have issues, they don't have problems as people who actually uh, do experience a lot of issues and are really good people? So what is the true purpose of our problems? Are they not what they seem? Are they more than what they seem? And more importantly, we want to focus on what is the true message of these problems? And the truth of the matter is that the problems that we experience are huge wake-up calls for us from Hashem, from God. We need to thank Hashem for our problems. Now, this can be a really far-fetched statement. And I'm going to share with you in this video what is the purpose of problems of our suffering in this world. Um, how do we approach these problems as well as how should we react to them? What is Hashem trying to tell us? And a practical tip at the end. Okay, so we learn in Pashat Balak about the merciful sword. The merciful sword teaches us that our problems are not what they seem to be. And we learn this when Bilam, who is going who is trying to destroy Klal Israel, the Jewish people. And when Hashem uncovered Bilam's eyes and he saw the angel of Hashem standing on the road with his sword drawn in his hand, he bowed his head and prostrated himself on his face, as it says in Bavidvar 22.31. So as he was trying to destroy the Jewish people uh, and, and, and through a curse, he stopped by his trustworthy donkey. And he stopped in his tracks. The third time he stops him in his tracks, he strikes the donkey. And he finally sees that the donkey has been trying to tell him a message. He finally sees what the donkey is seeing all along. And an angel had been standing in its way with a sword drawn, ready to kill Bilam. So this is after the third time. Interestingly, although earlier in this verse it says that the angel was trying to stop him, right? Rashi knows that this angel was actually a malach shel rachamim, a merciful angel. Hashem sent this angel to try to dissuade Bilam from doing something that would cost him his life. In order to do so, the angel had to threaten him with a sword. So Rav Pam tells us, that uh, he observed that angels of mercy often appear in our lives in different forms, sometimes quite frightening. So we can't always recognize those angels for what they are, but they are there to stop us in our tracks for our own good, to save our lives. So let's say, for example, when it comes to making shidduchim, when it comes to dating and marrying someone, a person oftentimes goes through many, many candidates. We know of people who went and almost got engaged or got engaged and had to have it called off and had to deal with that emotional in, in, intense energy and having it having to deal with that that disappointment it's it's very painful but at the end this is better than marrying that person and eventually getting divorced anyway but the malach carrying the sword that slit the shidduch was the angel of mercy it would certainly be worse for the couple to get married and then divorce afterwards with much more pain and baggage to handle, possibly even having kids. So when, when something doesn't happen, then it's, then this is really the angel of mercy. It's not really a problem. So our problems are really in disguise, angels of mercy. We have to be able to stop ourselves analyze, reflect, and say, you know, Hashem is trying to send me a message through this situation, through this person. What is the message? So this applies not only to a, to a shidduch, to a, a potential, you know, matchmaking or dating, but it also applies to life in all forms of life. An angel can come down to this world in the form of being fired. How many people have we heard that they have been fired and dismissed from their jobs and failed? 
and yet they be they they left and they thrived much more successfully doing something else um, when it happens in the beginning of course it is painful but ultimately we find out that it's actually for our best actually Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky before he came to became before he became a Rav in America he was applied for a rabbinical position in Europe but another candidate was chosen instead of course he was disappointed he needed the Parnassa he needed the livelihood he was desperate for making money he had no choice but to move to America. The Rav who was chosen to lead the community in Europe perished along with his townspeople at the hands of the Nazis during World War II. May their name be erased. But Hashem had bigger plans for Rav Kamenetsky and the only way to get him to move to America where he ultimately thrived and became a big Torah giant and Rosh Shiva in Torah Svodas was to cause that the community choose another Rav. So we won't always see the results in this world. However, Yeshaya Hanavi prophesied that when Mashiach comes, we will say, Odecha Hashem ki anafta bi. I thank you, Hashem, for you are angry with me. What does this mean? It may take until Mashiach comes, until his times. But we will ultimately thank Hashem for sending us what we originally thought was a difficult situation. Because in hindsight, those events will turn out to have saved our lives or made our lives much more pleasant. So when Mashiach comes, we will see and we will thank Hashem. Hashem was, it says Hashem is angry with me, meaning that we feel the pain and suffering. When Hashem is angry with me, Hashem doesn't have feelings. But we, we read that He does in a way that we can relate to. He can relate to us in a way that we can understand him, but the pain and suffering feels like he's disappointed in us. He's trying to send us a message. He knows we're bigger than that. We're more than that. He's trying to wake us up. So Hashem does not owe us an explanation for the suffering we had in this world. However, he gives each and every one of us a gift. And the gift is that after 120 years, we will dance and sing for the humiliations we had in this world, the embarrassments, the criticisms, the insults, the suffering, the problems, the challenges, the pain we had in this world, we will not only see, oh, that makes sense. I get it now. Totally makes sense. But we will dance and sing. We will rejoice. Why wait till 120 years? Might as well rejoice now and be happy with our circumstances in our lives. So what do I mean by suffering? What do we mean by suffering? Suffering can come from embarrassment, difficult people, a demanding boss, humiliation, a challenging spouse, trauma, challenging children, uh, criticism, and sickness. It could be also making parnasa, making a livelihood could be a suffering. So it could be a lot of different things, and it could be more than one. However, why wait? Why wait till Mashiach comes? If we embrace our challenges, our life will be that much sweeter, not only in the next world, but in this world. We can turn our whole reality, which seems meek, which seems bleak, which seems hopeless, we can turn it and it's go it could be a Ghanaian on earth. It could really be, maybe it may not seem all peaches and cream and everything may not go smoothly, but our, our lens, our rosy colored glasses are going to not only make life bearable, but pleasant and enjoyable. We can't serve Hashem when we're upset, when we're angry, when we're depressed and disappointed. We can only serve Hashem with joy, no matter what our circumstances. So we must bear in mind that no matter how bad it seems, don't judge your situation by its cover. Don't judge not even angels. You can't judge angels. Which Who are they really? They are really, the angels are really the problems we have with this world. When that shidduch doesn't work out, right? When the job doesn't work out, when you couldn't buy that house, or you couldn't move into that neighborhood, or you're trying to have so many children, it's not working out. It's happening for a reason. Of course, we should try and pray and do our own personal efforts. But at the end of the day, to smile, dance, and sing that this is ultimately for our best. So we know one of the challenges we had is dealing with difficult people. Sometimes that's really a suffering, whether it's a relative, a spouse, a boss. A person can truly 
become a blessing or bestow curses, just like Bilam wanted to bestow curses, we can learn how our words can either be a curse or they can actually be a statement using the same words. And we learn this from two candidates. We learn this from Rabbi Yose Ben Kisma and Bilam. So Bilam answered, answered and said to the servants of Balak, If Balak will give me his house, house full of silver and gold, I cannot transgress the word of Hashem, my God, to do anything small or great. Two people make strikingly similar, uh, strikingly different statements. But one is considered that this statement is a blessing. One is considered a statement is a curse. It may seem that they're similar. It may seem that they're different. But they're actually meaning something completely different. You can use the same words and it could be a blessing or it could be a curse. So, um, statement number one. In Parshas Balak, Bilam declares, If Balak will give me his house full, of silver and gold, I cannot transgress the word of Hashem, my God, to do anything small or great. So Rashi cites Hazal's teaching that this verse actually shows how greedy Bilam was and how he coveted other people's property. He really desired other people's things. Statement number two, in Pirkei Avot, we read an almost identical statement in the, from the Tana. Rabbi Yossi ben Kizma said, Once I was walking on the road, when a certain man met me, he greeted me and I returned his greeting. He said to me, Rabbi, from what place are you? I said to him, I, and I, I said to him, I'm from a great city of scholars and sages. He said to me, Rabbi, would you be living to, to live with us in our place? I would give you thousands upon thousands of golden diners, precious stones and pearls. And I replied, even if you were to give me all the silver and gold, precious stones and pearls in the world, I would dwell nowhere but in the place of Torah. And it's written in Avot, Pirkei Avot 6, 9. So there's three powerful messages we learn from two similar statements, and they could actually mean totally different things. Really same words, meaning totally different things. One a blessing and one a curse. So we're going to analyze them now. The first thing is that when Bilam, Bilam and Rabbi Yosef ben Kizma, Rabbi Yosef ben Kizma said, he really meant that the person he met already raised the issue of the salary, of money. And Rabbi Yosef was responding to what they said. He didn't bring up money. He was just responding. So once someone brings up the subject of money, the appropriate response is, you can give me all the money in the world. I will only live in a place of Torah. And what did Bilam say? Balak's officers, on the other hand, had only discussed honoring Bilam for his efforts to, to curse Klal Israel. They hadn't mentioned a word about money. Bilam's response sounded like, well, if you would give me a million dollars, I would do it. But that was totally out of place. It indeed is, it is a representative of the greedy way uh, of the way he's thinking, the ingrained way of his thinking. The second powerful message we learn is that the Chida, the sage, writes that there would have been nothing wrong with the first half of Bilam's words had he not uttered the second part of the sentence. When he connected money with not following Hashem's word, however, it was as though he was saying, listen, you realize that I would love to do this, especially for the right price, but unfortunately I cannot because Hashem won't let me. On the other hand, Rabbi Yosef ben Kizma statement was a principled response. He said, I will only live in a place of Torah, no matter how much money you give me, because I realize that it is the right thing to do. And the third idea is that had Bilam really said that he wanted a house full of money, Hazal wouldn't have censured him so severely. Hazal, our sages, would not have punished him so severely. However, the problem was that he wanted someone else's money. He said, if Balak will give me his household of gold and silver, this is human nature that Bilam had, one that we should be sure to eradicate from our own mindset and attitude towards money. 
There are people who genuinely just don't mind driving a simple car. Yet, once someone in the neighborhood has a Lexus, you also want a Lexus. Not because you want a Lexus, but because you want his Lexus. If you didn't have a Lexus, you wouldn't want it either. But because other people have it, you want their things. If they didn't have it, you wouldn't want it. It's not because you want a Lexus, because there were Lexuses. The, the Lexus car was invented a while ago. You didn't want it when it just came out. You want it because he has it, right? So that's a wrong way of thinking, just like Bilam. On the other hand, Rabbi Yosef ben Kizma wasn't referring to money belonging to a specific person. He said no matter whose money it was, it wouldn't convince him to live in a place that did not have Torah presence. We have to know that with our words, we can bless or we can curse using the same statement. And we need to know that dealing with difficult people who use words, who look like it's really a curse, it could be an opportunity for growth. It could be an opportunity to judge favorably. It could be an opportunity to work on our character, work on our humility, um, work on praying for them, right? Seeing the good in them. This is very powerful. It's very hard. Yet, this is an angel in disguise. Just like we said, it's a, it's a malach. We don't live in this world for anything except to overcome challenges. And these are our challenges. Life is challenges. We don't ask for challenges. But when they come, we know these are only opportunities and stepping stones to become bigger and greater people. So sometimes it's going to be a malach. It's going to be a difficult person. It's going to be that difficult job. It's going to be uh, a challenging boss or spouse or difficult making parnasa or raising that child who just twists you into a pretzel no matter what you do. But that really what that child is doing, what the situation is doing is molding me into a better person. And we need to experience the suffering in this world to be the person we're meant to come. So instead of being upset, angry, blaming, embrace your problems, embrace your issues and say, thank you, Hashem, for this challenge. I'm going to look beyond and I'm going to be better. I'm going to try to understand your message so that it's not a blast in the face. It's not a blast in my face, like just like it happened to Bilam the third time the donkey had to send that message and the sword was waiting for him from an angel. We don't want that powerful message. We want the subliminal messages. We want to connect to Hashem through those messages. And remember, our issues, our problems, our opportunities to shape us, not to break us, to make us. Appreciating the insights of Rabbi Franz on the Parsha, on the Parsha, inspired by Rabbi Franz on the Parsha, book three. The practical tip I want to leave you with is that before we speak, we need to ask ourselves, am I proud of what I'm about to say? Is this a blessing or a curse? I like to leave it as, at, you know, am I, am I proud of what I'm about to say? Just to keep it positive, just to keep it introspective, for us to become aware of the powerful words we are saying. Leah Abramov, Being and Becoming. Awakening awareness of your greatness and potential.